Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? Good. My name is Dr. Joseph Stewart, head of the history program here at the University of Mary, and I'm also chair of the Convocation Committee. So I want to welcome you this morning, this blustery morning, to this Convocation series, which is a series of public lectures at our university here on all sorts of different topics. And this one is titled, Are GM Crops to Blame for Recent Population Declines in Monarch Butterflies? Now, this convocation is part of the Faculty Excellence Series, where we feature University of Mary faculty who have really excelled in their work. And one of the faculty who has, has won this award, has the honor of winning this award, is Dr. Jack Boyle. He's a biologist here at the University of Mary who focuses on insect-plant interactions. As a grad student at Harvard University, he studied symbiosis between an East African thorn tree and the ants that lived on it and defended it. As a postdoc at William & Mary, he studied monarchs and their milkweed host plants. As a postdoc at Georgetown, he studied the genetics of mosquitoes and worked on a project to artificially select non-biting mosquitoes. He came to the University of Mary in 2020, where he continues the museum records research he describes in this talk that you're about to hear, as well as other marvelous projects in insect genetics. Dr. Boyle is reportedly beloved by exactly 100% of his students. <laughs> and his offering them extra credit today has no bearing on why they are present <laughs> at this convocation. Part of the Faculty Excellence Award involves a cash award. So please welcome Dr. Boyle and congratulate him on this award. Is the mic on? Does it need now it's on? It's green. Yep. Okay, I'm good. I'll just talk loudly for you guys, and then I guess the ether picks up the rest of it. Okay. And this is now. What do I need to press to make it go? I'll just use the keyboard. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's very gratifying to see you all, especially students who have suffered at my hands in the past and no longer are. So <laughs> thank you, guys, especially, for coming. Uh, so I am here to talk about my research that started several years ago when I was a postdoc at William & Mary and has continued on uh, to date on what is causing the declines in monarch butterflies that we have been observing over the past few decades. Uh, I'm going to focus in on genetically modified crops, but we'll talk about some other causes uh, that are possible uh, contributors to their, their changes in abundance. But maybe first I should try and convince you that we should care about monarchs. So let's do that first. Uh, this is a monarch butterfly caterpillar. It will metamorphose into a butterfly that looks like this. Uh, so for many people in North America, this is the largest and most beautiful insect that they're going to see. They're fairly beloved, right? Lots of people plant milkweeds in their gardens to have monarchs around. So they're pretty. That's one reason why we might want to care about them. Another reason is that they have lots of interesting characteristics. So when you see an animal like this with this sort of patterning of black and white and reds and oranges, typically that means it is toxic, and that is true for monarchs. Uh, they are very poisonous organisms. They are poisonous because they feed on milkweed. So the caterpillars only eat milkweed plants. This is an example of a milkweed. This is common milkweed. Uh, there are lots of different species of milkweeds. If you're a gardener and you have milkweeds in your garden, you might have more uh, ornamental-looking milkweeds that look quite different from this. 
But the thing that connects milkweeds together, or one thing, is that they're very highly toxic. Their leaves are packed with all sorts of very dangerous substances. Uh, very few animals can eat a milkweed plant safely. Monarchs are one of the few, so they have relatively little competition over milkweeds. Uh, and they're not only able to handle these toxins themselves, but they can store them in their own bodies uh, and make themselves toxic to predators. So that's an interesting behavior. Another interesting characteristic of monarchs is that they migrate. So at this time of year, all the monarchs in North America are in one very narrow part of Mexico uh, in sort of mountainous uh, fir forest and a relatively small number of acres uh, in Mexico. There's also a handful that are on the East Coast similarly, uh, but 99% of them, something like that, are here in Mexico. We're going to be focusing on that part of the population. If you go to these forests, you, know, you can see here is a, a branch of a tree covered in monarchs. They're just sort of sitting there, not really doing anything for most of the winter. This is one branch of the tree, but you, know, you might see monarchs like this on every branch of the tree, of every tree, for acres and acres. So that's a lot of monarchs. And they just spend the winter sitting there. And then when we get into the summer, those monarchs start flying north into the southeastern part of the United States. This is sort of the core of their range, although uh, there's, there's more. Uh, they will leave, you know, they're found outside this area just less commonly. Uh, so most of them are in sort of Texas and Oklahoma. They fly up to Texas and Oklahoma. They lay eggs. They die. Those eggs hatch, and the caterpillars eat the milkweed that is available in the spring in those regions, metamorphose into butterflies, and then those butterflies fly north themselves, lay eggs, uh, and this continues for several generations over the course of the summer as monarchs start spreading over most of eastern and central North America. And then as we get into the fall, those monarchs begin heading back to Mexico. They make the long flight uh, all the way back to those uh, you know, small forest regions in the mountains of Mexico. Although I shouldn't really say back, because the monarchs that are flying south into Mexico are the great-grandchildren of the great-great-grandchildren of the monarchs that left Mexico. No monarch butterfly both leaves Mexico and comes back. How do the ones in the fall know how to get there? We don't really know. There are some ideas, uh, hypotheses that are, are being worked on, but it is still something of a mystery. So that's a cool behavior with lots to learn about. Another interesting thing about the monarchs, a reason why we might want to have them around. Now, unfortunately, these monarchs are on the decline. Uh, you may have heard over the summer, uh, it made the news in quite a few places, that monarch butterflies are now endangered. This is a slightly exaggerated uh, topic. So they were listed as endangered by a major nonprofit that has its own endangered species list. They're not legally endangered. There's no legal status here. You can still hit a monarch with your car, and the feds won't come with you, come for you. But um, it's still you know, a sign that they're declining. And also, you'll note that it is not just the monarch butterfly that's being listed as endangered. It is a more narrow category of the migratory monarch butterfly. So the monarch butterflies in North America are being listed in danger. But the species as a whole is not in any danger. So there are Central American monarchs that just stay there all year round and don't migrate. Those are doing just fine. Monarchs have a baffling ability to cross oceans. They keep getting into you know, Pacific Islands and Australia and Europe. How exactly they're making those flights, we're not totally sure. Maybe they rest on ships along the way or something like that. Um, but they're arguably invasive species in many parts of the world. Uh, so as a species, we don't really need to be worried that there will be no monarch butterflies on Earth. But the mon our, our monarch butterflies, the ones that migrate back and forth in North America, are on the decline. That's real. So here is a figure. I didn't make this figure. Uh, so those of my students who are judging it because of how I've told you to judge figures, don't blame me. Uh, so this is looking at how many monarchs there are. Uh, dating back to 1993, that's when we first started paying attention to the numbers of monarchs. 
We measure this as the total area of forest in Mexico that's covered in monarchs. Uh, that's a simpler thing than trying to count 80 billion monarchs or however many there are. Um, so since 1993, when we started measuring them, it looks like there's been a fairly steady decline in their population sizes into about 2013. That was the lowest point for monarchs, and they've bounced back a bit since, but the modern, you know, sort of contemporary numbers of monarchs are still quite a bit off from their higher points in the 90s and early 2000s. And there's a number of explanations that have been put forward for why this might be. Uh, so these include things like, well, climate change with increasing temperatures, the milkweeds that are present in, you know, Texas and Oklahoma when the monarchs arrive are not, you know, blooming at the same time. And so there's this mismatch of when the milkweeds are, are there on the ground and when the monarchs are there and the monarchs don't get enough food and their populations decline. Or maybe there's fewer nectar resources for the adults to drink on their journey back to Mexico and so they're getting less sugar resources and dying along the migration path, and so there's less monarchs. Or maybe there's new predator or parasite pressures that they're facing that they weren't before. But probably the single biggest hypothesis, the one that's really captured the interest of both scientists and the public, is that genetically modified crops are to blame for this decline. So let's talk through why that might be. So if you are a corn farmer in this country, you are planting genetically modified corn. And it's modified uh, to be something called herbicide resistant. So herbicides are chemicals that kill plants. Uh, the herbicide that's used for this system is usually glyphosate. Uh, Roundup is the trade name. You might have seen that in your know, garden store. Uh, glyphosate is a broad spectrum herbicide. It kills almost everything. However, we've identified genes that give plants immunity to glyphosate. Uh, these are, are rarely found in nature. A few plants have them. Corn does not, but we have modified corn to give it this resistance gene. This makes life very convenient for farmers because you can wait until you, know, you plant your corn, your corn comes up, but also growing in your field will be a bunch of weeds that you don't want. You just spray, spray glyphosate on everything and it kills everything in the field. Every plant's dying except your corn that is modified to be resistant to it. And so this gets rid of the weeds while leaving your corn alone. In the old days, you couldn't have done this because the glyphosate would have killed the regular non-modified corn as well as everything else. But now you can. Uh, and so this is very convenient for farmers. It's very popular. Like I said, you know, 90 plus percent of the corn in the United States uh, that's being grown is genetically modified for this reason. Now, one of those weeds that is being knocked out by uh, glyphosate is common milkweed. Weeds there in the name, right? It was, for many decades, a notorious agricultural pest. And that's because milkweed is a disturbance specialist. So before humans showed up, it's specialized on colonizing areas where there weren't any plants. You know, so maybe after a mudslide, there's just this area where there, nothing is growing. Milkweeds show up and thrive there. Or after a fire, here's this big stretch of prairie where nothing's growing. Milkweeds show up and thrive there. The most disturbed habitat of all habitats is farmland, right? Somebody goes up and digs it up and destroys everything that's there every year, right? Uh, so this is an amazing habitat for milkweeds, and so they were this really common weed uh, until genetically modified crops show up. And once we start seeing farmers using glyphosate like this, the number of milkweeds in farmers' fields declined very rapidly. And so the idea is we're using glyphosate, it's killing all these milkweeds, Fewer milkweeds means fewer monarchs. It's a very compelling hypothesis, and it adds up. If we look at this decline, it matches very nicely with the introduction of genetically modified crops. So 1996 is the first herbicide-resistant crops are on the market available to farmers. By 2003, half of all corn and soybeans in the country are genetically modified. And by about 2010, almost 90%. Uh, were. So that's a lot of glyphosate being sprayed in fields, a lot of milkweeds being killed, and thus it goes fewer monarchs. And this hypothesis has captured the public uh, 
uh, eye so much that you can see it in the grocery store. Uh, you may have seen this on food labels. If you haven't, look out for it. It's pretty common. Uh, this is you know, a sign that there's no genetically modified crops in your food. Uh, if you go to their website, you can read about how this check mark is a very stylized milkweed plant with a monarch on it. Uh, in recognition of the threat that genetically modified crops pose to monarchs. Now, this stamp is maybe a little bit of a scam. Um, mostly, you're going to see it on wheat products, and there's no genetically modified wheat out there. It's all <laughs> natural wheat. So it doesn't really mean anything. It only means something if it's on corn, soy, or canola. Or I guess cotton, if you're eating cotton for some reason. That's also a commonly genetically modified crop. Uh, but if we really wanted to compare this hypothesis to some of the other hypotheses that I've talked about earlier just in passing, this data set is a little bit awkward for that because it begins right around the time when our genetically modified crops are being introduced. But we don't see much information about what monarchs were doing before that. Were monarchs fine? Were they increasing? Who knows? We don't know because we only started monitoring the monarchs in 1993. But we would like to know what was happening in the 80s, the 70s, the 50s, the 20s, if we really wanted to sort out these different hypotheses. But to do that, we would need a time machine. And so my job was to get a time machine. And we did that through specimen records. If you go to a science museum, you will find that the, well, you won't find this. You won't know it. But it is the tip of the public part is the tip of the iceberg. And somewhere in a basement, there are collections, uh, plants and animals that were collected by museum employees from various parts of the world uh, over decades or with some mu museum centuries. Here's an example of one. Uh, so this is from the Indiana University Herbarium. This is a common milkweed. Somebody went and clipped it off, pressed it, uh, dried it, taped it to this board, uh, and put it in a museum drawer. It's neat. You can see the flowers, whatever. It's pretty. But what I'm really interested in are the metadata or the information about where and when it was collected. So this is Asclepia syriaca, the common milkweed. It was collected on July 3, 1929, on a low roadside two and a half miles southeast of Van Buren in Grant County, Indiana. So now I know, having looked at this, that on July 3rd, 1929, there was at least one milkweed in Grant County, Indiana. This is not a lot of information about the past, right? Very little. But it's more than nothing. And if we get lots and lots and lots of these records, we might be able to build up a fairly comprehensive map of where milkweed were and when. And we can do this not just for milkweeds, but for monarchs as well. Here's a monarch from the Harvard University Lepidoptera collection. Lepidoptera are butterflies and moths. Again, it's a pretty animal, but what I'm interested in is the metadata. This was collected in the Grand Canyon of Colorado in 1989, and it is, in fact, Dinaeus plexippus. That's the common name or the scientific name for the monarch. So what my task was to, was to gather many of these specimen records for both monarchs and milkweeds, and also not just monarchs and milkweeds, but other plants uh, and butterflies and moths as well. 20 years ago, this would have been completely impossible. You would have had to go to dozens of different museums, maybe hundreds of different museums, uh, dig through their drawers, pull out all the milkweeds, all the monarchs. But fortunately, over the past you know, 10, 15 years, museums have been digitizing their records. So somebody has been going through these drawers and writing down all the metadata for all the specimens and making them available online. So I aggregated tons of these publicly available records. I got something like 5 million plant records from Eastern North America. Not all of those were monarchs. In fact, almost all of them were not monarchs, but, or sorry, milkweeds, plants. So 5 million plants. Of those, about 40,000 were milkweeds. And 300,000 Lepidoptera, butterfly and moth uh, specimens, of which about 1,200 were monarchs. And so from that, we were able to reconstruct how the population sizes of monarchs and milkweeds changed over the past uh, you know, 100 years, since 1900. Now, most of that project I'm not going to talk about here, uh, because a lot of it was trying to sort out 
potential biases in this data set. I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor for it. Uh, though. So here are just my numbers of how many plant species, not just milkweeds, but any plants, uh, I collected uh, digitized records since 1900, and how many uh, Lepidoptera records I had as well. Every year starting at 1900. And you can see in the early 40s, in both of our data sets, a sudden decline in the number of plants and the number of butterflies and moths. That's World War II. Now, what's happening there is not that when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, they blew up all the milkweeds, right? Uh, instead, what's happening is that during those years of the early 40s, many fewer people were interested in going out and collecting butterflies and going out and collecting plants. They, didn't, they had better things to do. There were better uses of government money at the time. And so fewer specimens made it into museums than in years when World War II wasn't happening. So this is a potential source of bias, right? If you compare the number of milkweeds in 1939 to the number of milkweeds in 1942, you're going to see a decline. But it's hard to say whether that decline is because there are fewer milkweeds out there in the year 1942 or just because fewer people are collecting milkweeds. That's a sort of bias. You need to be able to have some metric that will sort out those biases and give you a sort of mechanism for figuring out how many uh, monarchs are actually there on the ground. I'm not going to talk about the details of that. Almost all of this work was figuring out that metric and showing that it was actually accounting for biases uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, we'll skip to the results. Uh, we use this metric called relative occurrence. Uh, so this is not going to tell us exactly how many monarchs were on the ground. We can't say, ah, there were six monarchs per hectare in the year 1984. But we can use this metric to at least figure out year to year, are monarchs increasing or decreasing? Are milkweeds increasing or decreasing? And very nicely, we found that the trends for monarchs and the trends for milkweed were quite similar. So monarchs show maybe a little bit of an increase in the first half of the 20th century and then a decline in the second half of the 20th century into the 21st. It's a very noisy data set. Uh, there's lots of variability year to year. That's not surprising, uh, in part because there's fewer records for the monarchs, but also because insects naturally have these boom and bust population cycles. So we might expect a pattern like this. But if you just look at the average trend here in the orange line, it's a pretty steady decline every year since about 1950. And we see a very similar pattern in milkweeds. Uh, in fact, maybe a little bit stronger. Our points are closer to the trend line. Again, maybe more records, maybe just a more static population. Maybe an increase in the early part of the 20th century, and then a steady decline after. Both monarch and milkweed populations, uh, that decline seems to begin around 1950, a little bit before for milkweeds, a little bit after for monarchs. This is pretty good evidence that genetically modified crops are not to blame for these declines. Because this is when, so this is 2003, that's when half of the corn and soybeans in the United States are genetically modified. If you want to just, the very beginning of genetically crop modified crops, that would be here. Uh, but you can see that these declines long predate genetically modified crops. And they don't seem to change in, their, in the rate of decline when genetically modified crops get introduced. We don't see really any effect of genetically modified crops on this trend. So whatever is causing these monarch declines, it seems like it's something that has been going on for decades. And so we did a little bit of mathematical modeling, trying to uh, point some fingers at possible explanations. Um, a few that we, were, uh, we found evidence for, uh, so one is the consolidation of farms. Uh, over this period, we see uh, a fairly rapid decline in the number of farms since 1950. Uh, that is as small family farms are consolidating into larger, you know, more industrial farms. Uh, that seems to predict some of this decline in monarchs and milkweeds. Uh, 
Possibly we think the explanation for that is that a bunch of small family farms have hedgerows or some sort of uncultivated land separating the farms. And then if you buy them all and make one big uh, set of farms, you know, some of those hedgerows or fallow land is going to get just converted into cropland. And hedgerows are an especially good milkweed habitat, so maybe that's causing milkweed declines and monarch declines. Another trend that we saw that we think might be connected to monarch declines is just the reduction in the available amount of farmland. This is especially true on the East Coast, where over the 20th century, relatively unprofitable farmland was abandoned by farmers and just allowed to return to forest. Uh, so we see lots of farmland converted into forest uh, in the East Coast of the United States over this period. And again, forest is a less good habitat for milkweed than that very disturbed agricultural land. And so milkweed's losing habitat that way as well. That might explain some of these declines also. And then we also found that there is room for lots of other explanatory factors that we weren't able to test uh, directly. One thing that we noticed here, though, is these possible increases in the first half of the 20th century. Now, these you have to kind of squint to see them, right? It could just be noise in the data, a coincidence. We don't have a, as many records during this period as we do in the second half. So we're not 100% convinced that our data you know, proves that there are increases over the 40, 30s, 40s, 50s, et cetera. But we were interested in, those, in that signal in the data because it matched with a hypothesis that had previously been put out there uh, in the monarch butterfly literature, which was that it's called the Columbus hypothesis. And it's that maybe the, monarch, the number of monarchs that we see early on uh, in the 20th century, those very large numbers of monarchs, maybe those were not natural. Maybe those were caused by human beings. Maybe in the you know, year 1000 AD or 1500 AD or whatever, before European settlers show up and start converting, match up with that hypothesis. But if we really wanted to test that hypothesis, like the key time period is the, the, seven, or the 19th and the 18th centuries. That's when most of that conversion of natural land into farmland happens. And so that's when we would see the biggest increases in milkweed and monarch populations if that hypothesis was true. But with museum records, we just can't look back much further than 1900. There aren't enough records. So we would need a different time machine. And that is where population genetics comes in. I'm going to give you a very Reader's Digest version of how this works. Uh-oh. So your DNA is a series of nucleotides, A's, C's, G's, and T's, just all on a string. Uh, here's a stretch of DNA. Your actual DNA is much larger than that, billions of these A's, T's, G's, and C's, but it's just sort of like this. We have the ability to determine the sequence of nucleotides, and if you go out and look at a population of naturally occurring individuals, you'll see that members of the same species have very similar DNA sequences. Here's you know, six sequences from a bunch of of individuals of the same species. They're similar, but not identical. So you can see that there are a couple of areas in the DNA where some individuals have an A here, some have a C, some have a C here, some have a T. There's some variation. There's some diversity in the different DNA sequences. And we can use this diversity to learn things about the past. So let's imagine you know, mice on campus. I'm sure there are no mice on campus. Uh, for the people watching on YouTube, but imagine there were. It would be a, maybe a good place for mice. Uh, there's lots of food or whatever. So each one of these circles is going to represent a mouse with a different DNA sequence. Okay, And you know, it's a good time for mice. Uh, they're reproducing. So every year, each one of these mice with each DNA sequence are able to reproduce and pass that sequence along to the next generation, you know, year after year after year. But let's say across the river, it's a worse place for mice. Uh, there are fewer kind-hearted students for when the weather turns bad, let's say. Uh, but maybe 2019 was a very bad year for mice across the river. Uh, and half of them starved to death before they were able to pass on their genes. So only the, the yellow and the green ones 
were able to reproduce. And so the next year, there were half as many mice. And even if they recover in subsequent years, what we'll see is that there's less diversity in the DNA sequences because a few of those lineages were gone. They didn't reproduce themselves. They're no longer in the population. And so even years after this event happened, if you just look at today's mice, you'll still see this signature of that past event where there's less diversity across the river in DNA sequences than there is on our side. That's just a for instance of the sort of patterns, the sort of you can see in DNA and what you can get, learn about the past. You can also find out are populations growing or shrinking over time. If you have multiple populations, is there migrants that move from one population to another? Uh, can we see signs that some populations are undergoing natural selection? Uh, you can use patterns in DNA sequence diversity to answer all of these questions. And I won't talk about the details of that. Uh, really at all. But I will just sort of skip to the questions that we asked here. Uh, before I should do that, I should acknowledge uh, that to do this work, you need DNA sequence data, which means you need to go out and collect a bunch of organisms. I didn't do any of this collecting. I'm very grateful to my bosses at William and Mary, whose labs did a ton of collecting. Uh, all the circles are their sites where they went uh, over most of the range of common milkweed and collected specimens. And then we have some great collaborators at Cornell. All the square uh, collection sites are theirs. So between our two data sets, we covered almost the whole North American range of common milkweed and got specimens from the whole range to sequence their DNA. For butterflies, we used previously published specimens uh, from a John et al. Uh, paper uh, from a few years ago in Nature. And this allowed us to look at a lot of different genes, which gave us more power to find these patterns and thus reconstruct the demographic histories of these species. Uh, so for the milkweeds, we had 180 different milkweeds from across that range. We sequenced 800 genes uh, each. Uh, a little bit of a different structure for monarchs. We had fewer monarchs, but 10,000 plus uh, genes. So we were able to get a good handle on the patterns of diversity in these species. And that let us reconstruct their demography. And in particular, we were looking at whether or not there were three different events in their past. The first event we looked for was a post-glacial expansion, somewhere between 5 and 25,000 years ago. So 20,000 years ago was the last glacial maximum, the ice age. Uh, glaciers were covering most of North America. So at that point, all of our modern species, they weren't living on the glaciers. They were sort of jammed down into Texas and Florida. And then as those glaciers retreated over subsequent millennia, those species were able to move north and north and north. They had more habitat. And so we would expect to see that as their habitat expanded, the numbers in the population expanded. And we expected to see signatures of that in their DNA sequence diversity for these species. This is, would not be a surprise at all. In fact, we were very strongly assuming we would see this because uh, we see that for you know, most North American species. If you looked, you would find that. More interesting was an expansion with pre-industrial agriculture. So that's that period in which first most of the forests are being converted into farmland in the East Coast, and then most of the Great Plains are being converted into farmland in the central part of North America. That's mostly happening in this 1750 to 1900 period. We expected to see if the Columbus hypothesis is true, we expected to see increases in monarchs and milkweeds over that time period as milkweeds expand into this great new habitat of farmland and monarchs follow along. If the Columbus hypothesis isn't true, we wouldn't expect to see those increases during that time period. And then the last thing we looked for was a bottleneck with industrial agriculture post-World War II. So that was what we observed in our museum specimen data, would we see this in our, milk, in our population genetic data as well? What we saw was this. So again, with the population genetic data, just like with the records data, the milkweeds and the monarchs had similar trends. So their dynamics seem to be connected. We observe a post-glacial expansion for no species, for both species, no surprise. We expected that. 
we see an expansion in the 19th and 18th centuries in both species. So this is evidence for that Columbus hypothesis, that before humans, uh, well, before white people showed up, uh, there is agriculture in, in North America long before that, but not at the scales we think to affect uh, uh, monarch uh, and milkweed populations. Before this sort of really uh, sort of hardcore transition of forests and prairies, populations were smaller for both monarchs and milkweeds. Uh, and so they're larger today than they might have been in the past. And then interestingly, we didn't see any signs of a population decrease over the past you know, 70 or 80 years. There's a couple of reasons that could explain that. Uh, one could be that uh, it's simply too recent. It takes some time for demographic events to leave a signature in a population. And maybe we just haven't had enough time to start seeing that signature since those declines began. It could also mean, though, that the declines we see in the Mexican population might not be matched by declines everywhere in their life cycle. So maybe if there haven't been declines in the number of monarchs that leave Texas and Oklahoma in the spring, you might not see any genetic signature if that part of the life cycle has remained steady in terms of number of monarchs. Uh, that's another possible explanation for why we don't see signs in the genetic data uh, that we did see with the records data. All right, so putting these two data sets together, our two time machines, what can we say? A few things. I think it's pretty clear that genetically modified crops are not responsible for monarch declines. Those declines just begin way too early, and they don't seem to increase as genetically modified crops get introduced. So whatever is causing their declines, it's not genetically modified crops. You know, the glyphosate gang here is off the hook. However, there are various human activities that might well be responsible. You know, we as a species are very much not off the hook. You know, I talked about how our modeling suggested the consolidation of farms and the return of farmland to natural habitat could both be responsible for those declines. As there, and there's lots of other hypotheses as well, you know, changes in herbicide use that aren't related to genetically modified crops is another one. Uh, I think it's very likely that these uh, declines are related to other human activities that aren't genetically modified crops. But we also saw evidence that historical monarch increases might also be caused by humans. And that this means that the number, that these declines that we're seeing over the past decades might not be declines to extinction. Instead, they might just be an unnaturally large population sort of returning to historically low numbers, but low in a sustainable way, right? If there were many fewer monarchs in the year 1000 AD than there are now, that might be the sort of natural state of the monarch population, and that the reason there were so many in the 50s is that we destroyed all of these natural habitats and made a great milkweed uh, habitat very temporarily. Now, if monarchs are just, now I'm not saying that that is 100% the gospel truth. I'm just saying we have evidence for that that we didn't before. But let's say we proved it. Let's say we said Monarch populations in the past were a lot smaller than they are today. It was fine. The species survived. Should we still worry about monarch conservation if that's true? Right? If we find more evidence, we're very confident, should we still worry about monarch conservation? I'm going to say maybe for a couple of reasons. So first, they're neat. right? Even if they turn out to be unnaturally abundant, that this wasn't the historical number of monarchs that we see. That doesn't change the fact that people like monarchs, right? People plant milkweeds in their garden just to have monarchs around. They like to see them, right? Uh, we might want to keep having this many monarchs on the landscape because we like it, right? Historically, there are zero cats and very few dogs in North America. Now there are a ton of cats and dogs in North America. You know because we like to have them around. Even though it's unnatural 
it's nice, right? So maybe we still want to have an unnaturally high number of monarchs. If you're a little bit more bloody-minded about conservation, though, there are still some reasons why we might care about monarchs. And one is that monarchs are a stand-in for other population pollinator species. They're a good way to get sort of citizens excited about conserving pollinators. Because monarchs themselves, maybe not that important. If the worst happened and they all went extinct tomorrow, it would change our lives almost not at all. We'd be sad because we don't see them, but it wouldn't have any ecological or economic impacts. However, pollinating insects as a whole are incredibly important. The majority of plant species need an insect to come and pollinate them in order to reproduce. Loss of pollinators would be devastating ecologically and economically as well. A third of all crop plant species need pollination uh, to produce fruit. So pollinators, like monarchs, pollinators are on a whole as a decline, and ecologically and economically, that's pretty concerning. So if we can use monarchs as a way to protect pollinators more generally and use people caring about monarchs, I think we probably should. So generally, I think my moving forward recommendations would be, you know, if we want to think about monarch conservation, what we want to think about is what are things we can do for monarchs that will also help other pollinating insects? Uh, so things like promoting diversity of plants in a garden so that there's flowers and native flowers, especially uh, in that garden year round. Not using herbicides in places where it's not necessary. Roadsides are a, a especially common place where there isn't really any need to use herbicides there. Uh, shutting down that use of herbicide would be beneficial for monarchs, but also all sorts of other species as well. All right, lots of people helped uh, with this research. Uh, four different labs uh, were very closely involved. And then you know, uh, I worked with some, some collaborators at, at some of these museums and collections to help gather these specimens. Also, uh, many people provided money. For me, uh, Andrew Mellon Postdoc Fellowship was the biggest source of funding. Uh, and most of this research comes out of William and Mary, so thanks to them. Questions? Yes. Um, can you go into more specifics about how population genetics are used to um, like see population increases or decreases in the past? Like, how does that work? So I can probably not in 10 minutes go into more specifics, really. But so the flavor is you identify, um, you know, you can categorize your population into, you know, this set of sequences, so many individuals have this exact sequence, so many have this exact sequence, so many have this exact sequence. Uh, you can quantify things like, you know, one very simple metric is how many different sequences there are. Or others, there's, there's you know, Shannon indexes of what is the entropy of the sequence, right? Like, there are various complicated mathematical measurements, and there are sort of rules of thumb uh, for uh, linking those measurements to various population events in the past. Uh, we used a slightly more complex uh, approach that involved modeling uh, different scenarios and then matching those metrics in our actual data to the modeled metrics uh, and using sort of a machine learning algorithm to sort out uh, the likeliest uh, matches uh, from our uh, simulated data sets uh, to uh, our real data sets and from there predict uh, those metrics. But if I had two more of these, we could go into lots of detail. Uh, alas, I do not. Or maybe, thank God I don't. I don't know. If you're waving at me and I'm not seeing your hand, you can shout. Maybe not. Yes? Yes. So the migrating monarchs all seem to be a single population, both East Coast and West Coast, interestingly. Um, it seems there's enough gene flow between those two to keep them one big population. Uh, but the South American monarchs are a distinct population, as are uh, the sort of invasive monarchs in Europe and, and the Pacific as well. <laughs> 
So these monarchs are all, because they all return to Mexico and have a chance to you know, mate there or a single population, but um, they're distinct from the other populations. Yeah, good question. They di genetically diverged from the original migratory population. That's right. So that, after they make it to Europe or Australia or wherever, wherever they genetically diverge, in part because usually only a few individuals are going to make that transatlantic crossing. And so whatever their you know, versions of the gene were by chance will be dominant in the new population. But of course, also there's different selective pressures there, so we might imagine that there's natural selection on those populations that pull them in different directions than the ones that have to migrate across North America. Yes? Wendy, yep. I thought you had mentioned um, about Florida being a place for monarchs, and yet I didn't see that. Is it just not enough of them to include them on your side? Uh, so there are monarchs in Florida. They make it there, and in fact, it's, see, there's monarchs more or less year-round. However, we think that monarchs that go to Florida never leave Florida again. It's a population sink. Uh, it's sort of a, a population that is rife with parasites, and it seems like maybe just like you accidentally get to Florida instead of Mexico, and then you have a bad time, and your lineage dies out. But that just like keeps happening every year, so there's always monarchs there. Uh, I am making no analogies, those of you who are laughing, uh, just to be clear. Oh. Should we keep um, trying to grow milkweed for them, or should we just let nature do as it will? I suspect that planting milkweed is not one of the most efficient interventions. That uh, I think increasingly I'm beginning to believe that what we want to help monarchs is planting nectar, so sugar resources, planting plants that will provide sugar resources for the adults on their migration, either forward or backwards, and making sure that those plants are blooming when the migra migrants are migrating. Those are probably the most efficient. Uh, in terms of what you're doing with your garden, uh, milkweeds are great because you'll attract caterpillars, and you'll also attract milkweed flowers are uh, pretty high in, in sugar. Uh, and so they're, they're a reasonable resource, not just for, for monarchs, but for other pollinators as well. So I think they're valuable from the point of view of, of nectar. Uh, and then you get the monarchs in your yard, which is nice. There was a question, Joseph. There we go. Um, so I also saw that there's like a patch in California that monarchs kind of just stay year round. Um, and then they migrate up the coast to like That's Washington right. and everything. But I didn't notice your uh, DNA data collection samples um, spanning past like the Bismarck area. Is there a reason other than like lack of manpower or would that add a, like a? So, so good question. The map was the map of common milkweed, not of the monarchs. Oh. So common milkweed stops right around here. This is the edge of common milkweed. So that's why we didn't have any collections further west because there aren't any of that milkweed species further west. There are monarchs out there. Uh, we only used East Coast monarchs, but the reason for that is that the West Coast monarchs are the same population. So you don't really, it doesn't make a difference whether you include them in the analysis or not. But that's a good, good question. Um, so you collected data from like all around America, right? So you know like about where, um, the monarchs are so I was wondering if there's any like correlation in like their DNA and the location that they like end up as when they come from Mexico. So uh, we did not study this. Uh, that John et al. paper that I posted did. There is no correlation. That's a good question, though. Well, Monsignor insists that we leave exactly at 10:50, uh, but I will. Defy him enough to take questions in the hall if you uh, <laughs> Round still of applause. have a few. Well, thank you for having me. Wonderful. It was uh, a very fun thing to be able to talk research for a bit. Yeah, no kidding. The, the, the link with history, I just was delighted. <laughs> That's one of the cool things about the, the recent advances in population genetics. Yeah. 
Uh, this is fairly new that we can get that recent. Uh, 